For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Romans chapter 1 and, and verse 16. There are times within the life of the church when we're given opportunities to see the Scripture come to life, when we get to see the power of Scripture and the, the reality and the truth of Scripture a witness within the lives of God's people. And we, we saw that power this past week, didn't we? We saw that power in the uh, salvation of our, our dear sister Lindsay and, and uh, response of our dear brother Ryan. And, and we, we get to see that, that it's a real and living thing, right? That there truly is power in that. And that the Word of God is at work in you believers, as Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13. And that really fires me up. That, that, that gets me passionate for the cause of Christ and, and for the gospel. We've seen it in work at uh, work in our evangelism seminar uh, over this weekend and the good things that Chuck has been talking to us about. I think that we've seen the gospel and the word of God at work in that. We've seen the relevance of the passages that, that we're going to study this evening in Romans chapter 1. And I want to encourage you to be turning your Bibles to Romans chapter 1 as we continue our series on the book of Romans, which we've titled Reign of Grace, Reading Romans Responsibly. So go ahead and be turning your Bibles there. And we're mainly going to be focusing on verses 13 through 17 of Romans chapter 1 tonight. Now I will say that um, my intention for this study of Romans isn't to do a verse by verse. I know last week we did verses 1 through 7 and this tonight we're doing verses 13 through 17. But there will be times where we will cover three chapters or so within a couple of different lessons. And so it's not a meticulous study like that. But the first seven verses and verses 13 through 17 are very important to interpreting Paul's message within Romans, And so it's important for us to, to look at that this evening. Because what Paul shows us within these verses is that not only is there a power to the gospel, but there is an obligation, as we will talk about, that's laid upon those who receive the grace within the gospel to reach out to others with the transforming truth of the gospel. And I kind of thought it was uh, appropriate and maybe the Lord was working in this, that we just happened to fall on these verses um, when we were discussing our evangelism uh, seminar. <clears throat> Yet, interestingly enough, when, when Paul is coming to them and saying, I, I, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, I want to preach the gospel to you, as we've talked about before, he's talking to individuals that are already Christians. Right? I mean, these are Christians that he's writing to, and yet he says, I want to preach the gospel to you. Okay? And, and so what we begin to discover within these verses and within Romans is that the gospel and the preaching of the gospel isn't simply so that lost people can become saved, right? It's so saved people can remain saved. Right? And, and that as Christians, we need to continue to hear the message of repent and believe the gospel. Do you need to hear that in your daily life? I need to hear that in my, life, my daily life. And so Paul is coming to these Christians and he's saying, I want to preach the gospel to you. So, so there's a, a dual message here. He wants to preach the gospel, I think, to those who are lost, but also to those who are saved. And so within this context, we discover, I think, the proper attitude that we should have when sharing the gospel to other Christians and when sharing the gospel to non-believers as well. So let's read verses 13 through 17 together, and then we'll get into the text. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far I have been prevented in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So I am eager to reach, uh, preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, so to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous 
shall live by faith. What's the proper attitude and, and proper disposition that Paul has here? Well, the first thing that we see tonight is that Paul was under obligation, but he was eager. He was under obligation, but he was eager. Notice what he says there in uh, verse 14. I'm under obligation. The King James, if you're using the King James uh, tonight, it might say, I am a debtor, right? I'm a debtor, okay? And, and the debt that he felt, the obligation that he felt was to preach the gospel, was to preach the truth. And this meant it was a, a debt that he felt he, he had to, to, to live out. It was a weighty responsibility that was laid on him. He kind of has the spirit, for example, in 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 16, where it says, woe is me if I preach not the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, so there is this deep sense of responsibility for Paul. That he has to preach the gospel. This isn't an option. This isn't like where he sat back and said, okay, do I want to be a preacher? Or do I want to be a carpenter? Do I want to be a fisher? No, Paul says, I've got to do it. I, I feel this obligation to do this, this weighty responsibility. But the question is, why? Why does Paul feel that responsibility? Well, I think there's a couple of reasons. We've already looked at one of them last week, a couple of them. And that is, the number one, he was called to be an apostle. We already saw that in verse 1. He is called. He was called and commissioned and specifically to the Gentiles. He says that just in verse 13 here. He says it also in Romans chapter 11 and verse 13. That he's an apostle to the Gentiles. And so as this commissioned apostle of the Gentiles, as he says in verse 13 here, I, I, I want to reap a harvest among you as I have the other Gentiles, right? Right? So there's this idea of he has this commission and this responsibility and he feels an obligation to fulfill it. But I also think that this obligation came and this responsibility came from the very fact that Paul had received the grace of Christ himself. Right? Remember what he says in 1 Timothy 1, 15 and 16? This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. And then he talked about in verse 16 how he believes that Christ set him forth as a pattern to show what, what Jesus can do with people, essentially is what he's saying there. And so what Paul's saying is, I feel obligated to reach out to people with the grace of Christ because I've received the grace of Christ. And, and, I, and, I, and I know what it means to be lost. I know what it means to think I'm right when I'm actually dead wrong. And, and, I, and I, I feel this just deep sense of obligation to talk to people. Chuck talked about that in his own story, right? About how there came a point in time about a month after he was converted where he just got these chills as he realized how many people were out there who were just like him, who didn't know the gospel, right? That's that obligation. When we realize we've, we've received this great, this great grace, but what we begin to realize is there's a debt to that grace. A debt that never can be paid. And it moves us. It motivates. It, wor it works within us, right? I, 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 almost, every, almost every Christian that I've ever studied with, ever had the pleasure and the honor of, of baptizing into Christ, almost every single one, the first thing they do within a couple of days after they obey the gospel, is they go, number one, and tell people they were baptized. And number two, they try and get others to come and obey the gospel. Almost to, to every single one of them. Why is that? Because that's the response of grace. That's how you respond to grace. This reign of grace that we're talking about within Romans. And so no doubt this obligation that he has is similar to a lawyer or a servant who maybe served a man that he loved. And this, this man had many children who lived far away. And this, this man, he passed away and he had a great inheritance for his children. But his children didn't know about it. And so this lawyer or this servant felt this deep obligation to go and to search in the corners of the earth to find these children to let them know your father has an inheritance waiting for you back home. And so that's kind of the idea that Paul has here. I need to tell people about the inheritance that the Father has waiting for these sinners back home. <clears throat> but obligation, of course, seems to have a certain amount of baggage to it, right? It, 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 it seems like a, a grudging, 
responsibility. But notice what I said at the beginning. He was under obligation, but what does he say? I'm eager to do it. Notice what he says there in verse 15. So I am eager. I'm eager to preach the gospel. Not just obligated, but eager. This was an eager sense of absolute responsibility to preach the gospel message of Jesus Christ. He was excited about talking to these people about Jesus, about sharing the truth of Jesus. And no doubt this came from the joy of the message itself, but also from his own personal experience in receiving that gospel. Christians who, Christians who don't fully understand who don't fully understand the joy of knowing Jesus Christ have very little desire to share it with others. But if you come to know Christ and you come to know what He has done for you in your life, you have this eager desire, this joy. I want to share it with them. It's like, as I've talked, the example I've used before, it's the same reason we like showing people pictures of our vacation when we get back from vacation, right? Look, 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 look at what I did. Or, as you guys will be receiving in, after Thursday when the new baby Rutledge is born, <clears throat> tons of pictures, right? Look at our child. Why do we do that? Because it's a part of completing our joy. Our joy is not complete until we've shared it with others. And our joy in Christ is not complete until we have shared it with others. And so Paul is saying, I'm eager to do this, not simply for your benefit, but also for me. As he talks about in Philippians, to complete my joy. This makes me happy to do this. <clears throat> and so, people who live out God's truth and who see it working in people's lives, as we saw this last week and we've seen in this church before, when you see the Word of God really, really changing people, really hitting them at in their lives and in their hearts, when you see that, man, it fills you with this eagerness. And you feel God's power working within you. Paul talks about that in Colossians 1, 28-29. Where he says, we, we, we admonish every man and we teach every man so that we can present every man complete in Christ. And he says, for this reason I labor with the power that He works within me. Right? I see people becoming more like Jesus, and man, it fires me up to preach the gospel to them. Do you feel a sense of eager obligation to fulfill God's mission? That's how Paul is beginning his letter to the Romans. This isn't, some, this isn't a letter that I don't think Paul has been putting off and saying, Oh, no, you've got to write that letter to the Romans, man. Hey, Paul, did you just write that letter to the Romans? Yet? Oh, I forgot to write the letter to the Romans. No, he is eager. We talked about that, how I believe that the reason Paul wrote the letter to, to the Romans wasn't simply because of the Holy Spirit inspired I obviously believe the Holy Spirit inspired him to do it, but, but the context of it, as he talks it about in, in, within the first chapter, is that he wanted to preach the gospel to him, but he wasn't sure if he was going to be able to in person. He, experience had shown him that just because he desired to go there didn't mean he was going to make it there. And so he's, try, he's eager to preach the gospel to him and that eagerness shows in the epistle to the Romans which is one of the greatest, if you can gauge them, one of the greatest books in the entire New Testament. Right? Do you feel an eager obligation to fulfill God's mission? Do you feel a deep responsibility but a joyful excitement about the things God can do through your efforts with the gospel? This is the spirit that must pervade this church and any church if they have any hope of surviving, if they have any hope of growing and thriving. Yet this requires a great amount of conviction. It requires a great amount of courage when it comes to the gospel. Because not everyone, as we talked about on Friday, is going to receive the message the way that we'd hope. There's going to be rejection. There's going to be scorn even at times. And so not only is Paul under obligation but eager, he is also, secondly, he is unashamed and assured. He's unashamed and assured. Notice again what he says in verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now why does he have to say that? Now, no matter what age the gospel is found, no matter what 
time frame in which the gospel is discovered, it may seem, it's going to seem shameful to the vast majority of people. It's shameful to the intellectual elites who think it's too simplistic. It's shameful to the progressives who think it's shamefully restrictive. Or liberal theologians who try to make us feel shame for what they might refer to as divine child abuse. That's what they call the cross. And so individuals will always try and shame Christians for believing what is in their minds a very crude and vile message. For Paul... And this is something we're so separated from, we can't even barely grasp it, really. But for Paul, it was the shame of the cross itself, right? The, the crucifixion, that wasn't something you brought up at the dinner table, right? I mean, it's a shameful thing. You know, you're, you're sitting around the dinner table and you say, Hey, did you hear about uh, old Bob? Got crucified. Well, we don't talk about that. Shameful. Embarrassing. Scandalous. Right? And now all of a sudden, these Christians are taking this shameful, embarrassing, scandalous thing and they are viewing it as a symbol of salvation. And they're saying the man that hung there as a criminal is not only a survivor, but he's the savior of the world. And not only is he a savior of the world, he's the son of God. It's shameful. It's scandalous. It's ridiculous. And Paul recognizes that. I mean, he, he takes that on. He accepts that. He says, I know people want to shame me for this, but I'm not ashamed about it at all. He says in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 23, I preach Christ crucified. To the Jews, it's a stumbling block. To the Greeks, it's, it's ludicrous. Right? But, I, but to those, he says in verse 24, who are being saved, who are called, to those who are called, it is the power and the wisdom of God. That's exactly what he's saying in verse, chapter 1 and verse 16. I'm not ashamed of it. And it's in the midst of this that Paul boldly declares that he would not give in to the shame. That he would not allow them to shame him. Because he was assured of the power of the gospel. I don't, I don't care what you say. I know what it does. That's what Paul's saying. I, I know what the, the gospel does. It saved me. I've seen it save other people. It's changed people's lives. Why? You're not going to make me feel ashamed for that. Right? You're not going to make me feel bad for that. And so when we're convicted about the truth and the power of our beliefs, you simply don't care about the shame that other people place on you. That's the power of our theme for this year, which is know the message. If you really know what you believe, it doesn't matter if there's a million people telling you it's wrong or that's, that's silly or that's ridiculous. You say, but it's the truth. Amen. It's the truth. And you're not going to make me feel shame for something that saves people from death. That saves people from the wrath of God. I'm not going to feel shame for that. Don't let the world shame you for believing in the message of the gospel. And Paul says, I'm not ashamed. And so, interestingly enough, throughout the rest of the epistle, Paul will try and convey that same type of conviction that he has to these Roman Christians. He, he, he wants them to know what the gospel is. And that's why we said Romans is the gospel under the microscope. Because Paul's saying, I want you to know what all God has done to save humanity. And when you know that, you're going to step back as he does at the end of chapter 11 and say, oh, the depth and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. You're not going to feel shame for it. You're going to feel awe. Right? You're going to feel reverence. And I think this is extremely applicable to our day and time. I think it's extremely applicable for the church in today's culture. <clears throat> because we live in a culture that tries to place increasing amounts of shame on the church for the gospel and for the teaching of truth. Whether it's philosophical, who are represented by the Greeks in Paul's day, or the sensational, as represented by the Jews, who ask for a sign and for power. In the church... We must know the message of the gospel and we see it working in the lives of other people and we don't allow the culture to shame us because what happens when you allow the culture to shame you is that you begin to change the message of the gospel to fit the culture. 
Why do churches do that? Why are there churches now who openly accept, accept practicing homosexuals into their fellowship? I'm not talking about people who struggle with same-sex urges or, and who are willing to, to uh, 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 repent of that. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about individuals who are in an active homosexual relationship, not only even accepting them in, but placing them in positions of authority. Why is that happening? Well, why do you think it's happening? It's because they're ashamed of the gospel. They're ashamed of the gospel. They're ashamed that it says there, there are certain things that you have to repent of. It's not saying, I'm better than you. It's saying, we're all really, really, really messed up. Okay? And, and there's some things you've got to change. There's some things I have to change. And our sins might not look the same. But if we don't repent, we're going to the same place. And the grace of God and the love of God reaches out to you and says, you can be saved from that. In churches who are ashamed of the gospel and who don't know the message of the truth, they will bend to culture every single time. Every time. Because they're ashamed of the gospel. And Paul says, I don't care if you bring the whole Roman Empire against me. I'm not changing. Because I'm not ashamed of it. And so, he was unashamed and assured. And thirdly and finally for this evening, he was unprejudiced. He was unprejudiced, but he was conditional. He was unprejudiced, but conditional. Paul wants to emphasize that the gospel is not limited to any particular social class. Now, this plays a big part in interpreting Romans, and you need to understand this. Because Paul wants to emphasize that the gospel is not limited to a particular social class, which is, as he says in verse 14, Greeks or barbarians. That the gospel is not limited to any intellectual class, that is, to the wise or to the foolish. And that the gospel is not limited to any ethnic group, to the Jew or to the Greek. And what Paul is going to show within the gospel, within Romans, is, is how God is able to bring in all people of, of all social classes under the cross of Christ. The amazing truth that Paul is teaching within Romans and within other places that got him into so much trouble, particularly with the Jews, was that the gospel was for all people. That the kingdom was now for all people. And, and, and everyone in here tonight better say, thank you, Lord, for that. Okay? Because I would say the vast majority of us aren't Jews. Okay? We're Gentiles. We're barbarians. Right? And so, this is specific to you and to me. Which, by the way, shows us that one of the greatest sins that the church can commit is by showing racism and prejudice when they share the gospel of Jesus Christ. The church of the past will be held accountable for that. And moving forward, as a people of God, we must be very careful that we are not sharing the gospel with prejudice, or with racist intent. That's not allowed in the kingdom of Christ. It's not allowed here. It's not allowed anywhere in the kingdom of Jesus. And again, Paul is going to show within the epistle how the Gentiles actually have been brought into the kingdom by God's rejection of the Jews. And we'll talk about that. Not full out rejection of Jewish people but the rejection of the Jewish nation as the singular people of God. And we'll talk about how that plays out within salvation. But even though the, the message is unprejudiced, this doesn't mean that there aren't conditions for salvation. The power is in the gospel, but for a specific group of people. Not Jews, not Greeks, but for who? For everyone, he says, who believes. Notice this is what he says in verse 16, to everyone who believes, to the Jew and also to the Greek. Now, the grace of God, this reign of grace that he talks about within this epistle, was given, um, has given uh, us the gift of salvation within Christ and it's received by faith. Now, I do want you to notice, and I've talked about this before, that we'll occasionally mention Calvinism within this. And, and, and that is that when I say faith, I did not say faith alone. And the reason I don't say faith alone is because 
That's not Paul's intent when he says faith alone. Because faith alone generally has the idea of uh, an intellectual assent. That is, once you accept the truth of the gospel. But, that, but that's not Paul's intent here. Now, grace, the, the gospel is received by grace through faith. Now, that's a true statement. Okay. But it's a faith that sees Christ for who He is and that accepts His gift of salvation that Paul will later talk about in Romans 3 and verse 23 with confession, with penitence, and ultimately within baptism. The confession, penitence, and baptism are acts of faith. Right? We need to be very careful about saying, well, um, baptism is a work. Because the way that the Bible talks about works, it's not a work in that sense. Okay? It's, it is, it is a work. It's the work of God, right? Colossians 2 and verse 12. We have faith in what? In the powerful working of God, right? It's an act of faith in which we receive the grace of Christ within baptism. And we're trusting in baptism for God to do what He says He's going to do, which is save us. If you repent, confess, and are baptized, the Lord says, I'll save you, right? So baptism is us calling on the name of the Lord. Acts 22 and verse 16. Lord, save me. We don't literally say that. But we're saying that in our hearts to the Lord. Lord, save me. And then this causes us to, as he says in Romans 6 and verse 5, to walk in the newness of life, which is exactly what Paul has talked about in Romans 1 and verse 5 when he says that the gospel is for the obedience of faith. Faith is will automatically result in submissive obedience to the Lordship of Christ. And faith and obedience are so closely connected to each other that James would say later on that faith without works is what? Is dead. There's no such thing as faith without works. There's no such thing as faith without obedience. But as we talked about last week, Jesus isn't just looking for legalistic, cold rule-keeping. He's looking, as he says in Romans 1 and verse 5, and in 16, 26, and 15, 28, he's looking for obedience that results from faith. That comes from a deep trust in the saving work of Jesus Christ. And what this means for us is that as we reach out to others and share with them the good news of Jesus, we must do it without prejudice, without, as the Bible refers to, partiality, respect of persons, Because the gospel is for the college professor and the gospel is for the local hairdresser. It's for the neighbor next door who's white. It's also for the neighbor next door who's black. It's also for the neighbor next door who's Hispanic, Asian, whatever it is. It's for them. And brethren, I'm telling you, be careful of that. I don't want to be the person that stands before God. And God says, why didn't you share the gospel with your black neighbor? I don't want to answer that question. Okay? Neither should you. The gospel should be shared without prejudice, without partiality, and we must be sure that we do not diminish the conditions for salvation simply because we don't want to offend people or to run them off. We cannot diminish that, right? If you want to receive salvation, it is for you, for everyone who believes. Will you accept it? This, and, and as Chuck talked about this weekend, some people are going to say, no, I, that's not on me. Right? That's not on me. The offer is there. We often talk about the great things that Paul did for the church, and that's very true. We don't want to diminish that in any way. But as we talked about in the previous week, Paul not only recognized himself as an apostle, before he said he was an apostle, as he began this epistle, he said he was a what? I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. Right? He's just fulfilling the mission of the Master. But because he was eagerly obligated, felt the eager responsibility of the gospel, because he was unashamed and assured of the truth that he was teaching, and because he was unprejudiced but conditional in the terms of salvation that he shared, he was able to bring people to the grace of Christ. There's a lot of servants here tonight. And I know that the Lord can work in you and through you to bring people to Jesus. 
if we follow the pattern that Paul has laid out here in these verses. And he's going to show more and more within the gospel of, uh, that he teaches to the Romans in this epistle how all of this plays out. And we will see Paul's passion, man. You, you are going to see Paul's passion within the epistle to the Romans because he is so passionate about what he's telling them. Tonight, are you willing to receive Christ in faith, to repent of your sins, to confess Him, to be baptized this evening for the forgiveness of your sins, and to rise and to walk in newness of life? Maybe you have some struggles or some things that you need to ask the prayers for church for. Maybe it's not struggles. Maybe you're not struggling with a sin. Maybe it's just that you're going through a tough time and you need your brothers and sisters in Christ to give you a hug, to, to, to reconfirm their love to you. Whatever your need is, why don't you come forward together we stand and as we sing. There will be